Around the neighborhood, I've become known as the guy who can't say no to someone selling a motorcycle. And last year, a neighbor came by and said he had a bike that had been sitting for a very long time and he wanted it out of his yard. Never looking a gift horse in the mouth, I went to look at this abandoned 1994 Kawasaki ZX6 and wound up bringing it home. Known as the ZZR600 in Europe, this version of the Ninja I've always found a bit confusing. The bike was purposely made for road use and in its day was an excellent middleweight sport tour with a comfortable seating position and 100 horsepower. The Ninja ZX6 was no slouch with a top speed of around 150 miles per hour. Overall, a decent performance package. Considering this was the era of Japanese tariffs, a new Ninja ZX6 sent you back about 6700 bucks in 1994. With inflation, that doubles to over $14,000 in today's money. A brand new 2022 ZX6R would be $4,000 less and has over 30 more horsepower plus a bunch of technology that you couldn't buy at any price 30 years ago. So it was one of the more expensive crotch rockets of its time, a few hundred dollars more even than the Honda CBR 600 F2, which had the same 100 horsepower engine performance and over a thousand dollars more than the budget favorite Suzuki GSX 600F, whose air-cooled engine engine reflected the price difference at only 87 horsepower. The fact of the matter is, Kawasaki didn't put much of any racing emphasis on its middleweight bikes, that is, up until 1994. But with the success of the ZX-7R, the ZX-9R, both in North America and Europe, I think that Kawasaki in second is Von Tempe because there's Russell mired back two places behind Terry Reimer. In the hands of riders like Scott Russell, Pierre Giorgio Bontempi, and the tragic Anthony Gobert, who closed out the 1994 Superbike season on a Kawasaki after leaving Honda earlier in the year. Oh no, surely not. Yes, this is Anthony Gobert at his best. At least he's wearing underwear. But you can bet your life that Anthony Gobert, being the kind of exhibitionist that he is, he may not be wearing it for very much longer. Well, they call him the Go Show. Those leathers are worth an absolute fortune. They are a double set of race winning leathers and there is going to be a, a fight. some kind of a fight down there that you can't believe. And yep, well that bottle's already down to the bottom, isn't it? And Kawasaki Road Racing was on an upswing and they even had a video game coming out for Christmas that year. Although the Pinnacle 600cc Kawasaki in 1994, the Ninja ZX6 and its European counterpart, the ZZR600, were usurped in 1995 with the introduction of the Ninja ZX6R, a bike that used the same engine in a newer, more race-worthy frame based on the ZX9R and had so many more performance improvements like a larger rear brake, adjustable front suspension, and improved seating and lean angles that gave the bike a more aggressive look as well as a better ride. Even more confusing was the new Ninja was priced about the same as the old bike, which was still offered as a more road-friendly trim set. But motorcycle history is like pornography to me, something I can enjoy for hours, but it really doesn't help me in my present situation. So back to my abandoned bike. It had been there for well over 10 years, but surprisingly had a key in it and certainly looked complete. My neighbor's son, who had long since moved away from home, had ridden this bike a couple of decades ago and it's been sitting outside uncovered at mom and dad since he moved out about 15 years ago. I took the bike and without any room in my own garage, I covered it up and stored it outside for about a year myself. I had every intention of making a video about what not to buy and what you should avoid in an old motorcycle like this one, but as I dig deeper, the more intrigued I am. With my 2012 Goldwing on parts hold, I thought it would be a good time to see if I could resurrect this nearly 30 year old bike. Since the bike has been outside in the elements for so long, almost everything is seized. The ignition key was in the bike, but it didn't turn. 
The brakes are non-functional since they don't move at all. The chain is just one inflexible continuous loop of metal and the wheels and axles make this sickening sound while they turn. With all the oxidization and rust, it makes this sub 400 pound bike move around like it's an 1100 pound Boss Haas. But with some penetrating fluid and air in the tires, it eventually moved. This bike is definitely one of the most challenging I've had for a while, so I put it up on my hoist to figure out what was here. Now I know getting into this that any effort or money spent going forward is probably a waste, but if you watch the channel, you know that I can't seem to pass up a chance to put a bike back on the road. The key tumbler for the seat was also seized, but after some more penetrating fluid, it turned. I expected the cable to be broken or just so badly rusted that it was going to break anyway, but to my surprise, it was in good shape, and once the key was able to turn, the seat lock opened up to reveal some of the tools that had been left here by the previous owner, and this is a good example of how much time has passed since the last time the seat was off. Removing the panels is a bit tricky, since you're not trying to damage or strip the Phillips screw heads. In some cases, I had to use my impact screwdriver to get things loose, or worse, I had to drill out and use an easy out in some of the fittings. The fuel tank was also about half full of what was primarily old fuel. The tank was sealed, but fuel, especially fuel with ethanol in it, absorbs water if left over time. Water means rust, and our ZX6 tank had its fair share of it. This rust actually clogged the lines and the tank outlet filters, which was probably fortunate for the bike, but more on that in just a few minutes. If you thought I was exaggerating about how long this bike had been sitting outside, here's a quick look after the tank and seat were removed. The turn signal relay was sitting upside down on the engine block when I found it. I think I'm going to have to replace it. Once past this horror show though, the bike started to show some promise. The airbox was in good shape, properly mounted to the carburetors, and it didn't have any water in it. The old style cloth element was intact until I went to remove it and then it just disintegrated like a dried up leaf. With the air box out of the way, I decided to remove the plugs and scope the cylinders. The cylinders looked surprisingly good. I didn't see any signs of rust or debris. I mean, technically, this bike has less than 22 and a half thousand kilometers, so I wasn't expecting to see a lot of damage. The air box was sealed, so that should have ruled out any water getting into the cylinders. But when we got to cylinder number four, there was a bit of an issue. There's fluid in the cylinder, and what you're actually seeing is the reflection of the scope cam in the fluid sitting on top of the piston. I wasn't sure where this was coming from at first, so I popped the radiator cap to check the coolant, and there was lots in the radiator. The gravity checked out, good to minus 30, so the coolant wasn't an issue, and the bike hasn't froze. I had checked the oil in the bike when I first got it home, and didn't see anything other than oil in it at the time. A quick look at the sight glass shows lots of oil in the crank, and there was no gas coming out of the tank when I took the lines off, even though that tank was about half full. So the petcock was holding in the off position, or at least that's what I thought. In reviewing the footage I shot earlier, it's clear to see the petcock was actually in the on position prior to rolling it up on the hoist. The reason the tank didn't flow any fuel, as I mentioned earlier, was due to the rust and debris in the tank plugging the fuel outlet filters. But these filters were plugged after a significant volume of fuel found its way into the engine. The number four cylinder has old fuel in it, and this fuel eventually has seeped down into the crankcase, and upon removing the crank filler cap, there's about double the amount of oil in it than when I got it home, or at least a mixture of oil and old fuel. This must have happened over the past year after I parked it up. The old fuel, although not a great lubricant, is not catastrophic to the engine, and as you can see, the old diluted oil actually looks fairly clean. This is one of the many reasons I avoid carbureted bikes. And for those of you who continue to ask about VFR 750s, take note. If the petcock is left on, even when it's vacuum actuated, or in the case of our Ninja here, uses an electric fuel pump between the petcock and fuel rail, fuel from the tank can slowly move past the valve and overflow the carburetor float bowls. And then of course it's straight down the cylinder wall. This just can't happen with a fuel injected bike.
Draining the crank took a while, and after refilling it with some clean oil, I sprayed some penetrating fluid as a bit of a lubricant in the cylinders and installed a battery out of one of my other bikes to see if this Ninja would crank. Power did bring some of the bike back to life, but unfortunately there was no cranking of the engine. Now this wasn't entirely surprising, and I see this question get asked a lot in forum groups and on Reddit. The bike just doesn't start even though it clearly has power, and this typically happens after winter storage or if the bike is left for an extended period. Most riders will fear the worst and start taking apart their electrical system, testing relays, buying new batteries, removing starters and other related components, overlooking the obvious. Here is actually the problem in the majority of cases. It's the handlebar switch. The contacts in these switches are no longer coming together. Dirty or seized with dust and moisture, they can't flow the electrical current necessary. I know sometimes it looks like I fix everything with WD-40, but... Results speak for themselves. Next time you have a faulty signal light, headlight, or starter, be sure to check this minor quick maintenance item. Lubricating your switches with penetrating fluid will also make the switches move much more easily. So it's a good idea to do this every few years, especially if you have a motorcycle that's stored outside or in a dusty parking garage. With the throttle and switch housing apart, I took the time to lube the cables, first with penetrating fluid to clean the dirt and rust, and then with a gel lube that'll stay in the lines with more permanence. With the starter and kill switch now working, I was able to crank the engine and clear cylinder number four of the old fuel. If you listen, you can hear the starter clutch engage and then slip. The starter, or sometimes it's called the sprag clutch, engages the starter to the flywheel and turns the engine over. And this slipping is somewhat intermittent, but the part is a wear item and I found a new replacement part on eBay for only 50 bucks so this part marks the first real money spent on this bike. To test the starter clutch I took the left side engine cover off that houses the stator. According to the Kawasaki manual if you can rotate the gear on the starter clutch one way but not the other it should be good. Even though this was the case with our Sprague the starter clutch is not engaging under load and you can see that when I hold the starter gear in place and engage the starter. All the gears turn, but we have nothing happening at the flywheel, so the mechanism inside the starter clutch is pooched. But before it gave way for good, I was able to turn the engine over with the plugs removed and check for spark at the four leads. All of the plugs spark, so we may actually have a runner here. While I'm waiting for the new starter clutch to arrive, the fuel tank removed, the carburetors in need of rebuilding, I used an old school method of putting a little raw fuel down the carburetors. Well, it looks like we have a faint heartbeat that should be able to be revived with the new Sprague installed. I hope this will be the end of the starter issues, but then what? Restore it to its original form or modify it into a cafe or something else? If you have an idea, put them in the comments section. And until next time, be sure to ride safe.